the, the way we're going to operate is uh, you're going to get a presentation of a, of a case which is 36 and a half years old. And after the presentation, we'll take questions from the reporters in the audience. After the questions from the audience um, are asked and answered, we will take them from the phone. I, uh, what we're not going to cover today um, are, there's a lot of things that we don't know, and we'll explain that as we get along. The purpose of today is to, the number one purpose of today is to allow the family some comfort knowing that we, the, uh, your relative, your, your sister, your niece um, have been identified and that we'll move forward. We're getting the remains to the family so you can take care of them. And the second is, of course, the criminal investigation. And the press conference you're going to hear today um, is not going to come to a conclusion at the end by telling you we have someone in custody because we don't. We believe that there's information in the public that we're hoping that uh, today's press conference will bring somebody to call our tip number, which you're going to see several times throughout the press conference of 707-234-2100. I certainly appreciate the press being here. I appreciate the employees of the sheriff's office being here. But most importantly, I appreciate the families being here. This is a, a big day for you. I understand that. And I'm sure that you were a little apprehensive of being here. But I, I appreciate you being here to allow the sheriff's office, both Sonoma County Sheriff's Office, to, which will, is here, and Mendocino County Sheriff's Office, to express our very deep sympathy to you and to, greet, to bring you up to speed of where we are in the investigation. The investigation for Mendocino County started on July 8, 1979. On July 8th, um, two tourists were on Highway 20 traveling towards Fort Bragg and they pulled over approximately 11 miles, 12 miles west of Willits. Uh, one, the male went for a walk and came back and said he thought he had found the, the remains of at least two people. So um, this, was, this was in a day long before cell phones. They marked the um, area with a, with a soda pop can and they went to a phone and they contacted uh, the sheriff's office and we, the sheriff's office, it wasn't me, I was still in high school, uh, we sent three people, three investigators to the scene, two of which are here, two of which are here today. Um, then Sergeant Jim Tuso, retired Sheriff Jim Tuso, um, in the blue jacket behind us, and then Deputy Detective Roy Gorley. In the black jacket. Um, they were involved in the initial investigation 36 and a half years ago, and I, I appreciate you being here today. Um, our detectives have continued to work with past employees of the sheriff's office for any information which um, need the questions need answering in the reports. And also remember, our reports uh, in 1979 weren't computerized. The vast majority of reports in this case are handwritten, and so our, our detective in charge of this case, Detective Quincy Cromer, is a uh, has, knows the case inside and out and read, has read every handwritten report if they can read the handwriting that we possibly have. So Quincy, thank you very much for your, work, your hard work on this one. The remains that the Sheriff's Office found that day appeared to be that of two possible teenagers, two young adults. At that time, uh, the remains and the evidence was collected in a, in a two day period and the remains were sent to both a our, uh, forensic pathologist here in town, but also uh, to a uh, anthropologist for examination. Now the reason for this um, is that the remains were somewhat limited in evidence and cells and identifying features. So approximately 90% of the bones have been located at that scene, and we, uh, we packaged them up and sent them to anthropologists for the purpose of identifying them. For some reason, and I, I don't know why, in 1980, the remains were classified as a found male and a found female, uh, both approximately aged 14. So fast forwarding um, from 1979 to 1985, a vast majority of the evidence was sent to the FBI. Um, there's evidence involved in this case and there's facts involved in this case that I'm not going to discuss today. There's facts involved in this case that would only be known to the investigators and to the responsible party. And while we certainly want to tell the family members everything that we possibly can, 
I hope you understand that there's some facts that we're not going to say because it allows us to get closer to the true identity, which in 2000, a person in a New Jersey uh, state prison confessed to this murder. And then uh, the, the sheriff uh, sent Lieutenant Pintain to New Jersey to interview the suspect. However, this, as it turns out, the suspect would have only been 12 years old at the time of the murder, and he had never left New Jersey. The investigation found a newspaper clipping that he had taken all the information out of the newspaper and turned it into his own story and caused a, a great deal of commotion. However, in 2000, that was the first time that the remains had been exhumed. And, I, and reminding people where we've come in criminology, DNA certainly wasn't uh, discussed in 1979. And it was only until the late 90s that really and truly law enforcement had good access to DNA. There are some cases, and we were talking about today, in the late 80s when DNA was first being developed and, and discussed. However, it wasn't until the late 90s that law enforcement could, on a regular basis, contribute DNA to, to a laboratory for analysis. So in 2000, during the exhumation, the, some DNA was obtained from the bones and sent to um, some laboratories for an analysis. And as far as we know, our records do not show any type of return from the lab from that DNA submission. We, we never got a, a return from it. Now in, in 2011, there were a lot of things that changed. In 2011, the National Center for the Missing and Exploited Children, working with a British Broadcasting Corporation, uh, were, they were working on a program which the British Broadcasting System was working to investigate cold crimes in America, right, for a TV show in, in England. And in 2011, the bones were exhumed one more time, and this was for the purpose of getting the absolute best scientific DNA possible. The exhumation occurred, and the, the DNA was sent to the University of North Texas, to the Institution of Human Identification. In, during 2011, in November of 2011, and November of 2015, so just last two, two months ago, the DNA was examined, and two months ago, the final confirmation came to the Sheriff's Office of identifying the remains. The remains, as you see in front of you, Gary Ann Graham, 15 years old, Francine Trimble, 14, were good friends. They lived fairly close to each other in Forestville. They attended the same school. And as, as their relatives have said, if one of them wasn't home, they knew that the other was with, with their friend, their best friend. They traveled together and, and they hung together. They were last seen in December of 1978 in Forestville, stating that they were going to the Cottingtown Mall. There's a discrepancy on the two dates that they were last seen, one being the middle of December, one being the day before Christmas, Christmas Eve. But we certainly know that the last time they were seen by anybody that we have spoken to, it was December of 1978. Unfortunately, Francine Trimble's immediate family, mother, father, and brother, have passed away from natural causes. And they they can't be here today, and they, they certainly died not knowing whatever happened to their daughter and sister. We certainly appreciate the uncle and aunts who are here today. Thank you very much. And Terry Graham is survived, is survived by mother, father, and brother and sister. The Sheriff's Office is seeking information regarding, both the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office and Mendocino County Sheriff's Office are seeking information as to what happened in the 24 hours prior to these young girls missing? Where were they? Who did they go to the mall with? Did they get, get a ride with? Where did they last shop? Did they ever make it to the mall? These are questions that we don't know. I know that the, there are some, some newspaper reporters who have researched this, and to be quite honest, there are very few details about two missing girls from Forestville in 1978. And so, Deputy Cromer has worked extensively through the history of the books, to find out where we are, but we're hoping that somebody out there knows something. There certainly is a, as I said, the tip line, 
but I, I want to cover the PowerPoint a little bit. As we're covering the PowerPoint, and there's a map to your right, um, there's a red arrow right here. The red arrow is approximately 11 miles west of Willits. Willits is there. The closest house is approximately five miles from um, where the remains were found. Uh, so this is a, an absolute what happened and, and who did what. So as we go through the PowerPoint, um, you see the, the Google Earth, similar crime scene. This is pre-Google Earth, that's post-Google Earth, of where the, the crime scene is. Okay, Quincy. And so Sergeant Gander, Sergeant Tuso, and um, Detective Chuck Jackson, who's passed away, um, were the first responding units. And yes, the black and white pictures you see are the black and white pictures we have in evidence um, at the scene. And uh, as I said, this was a two-day collection at the crime scene. Okay. Another photograph of the crime scene itself. We certainly appreciate the fact that we had some crime scene photos to go on. I'm, I'm not sure if Sergeant Beathard was a, the person collecting the, the photographs, but we certainly are appreciative of this because it gives us a very good idea of, of this location. Okay. A single earring belonged to Carrie Ann Graham. Um, and we have the single earring here. We're certainly believed that there were two earrings, um, and the, the earring is going to be available for, the, for you to look at. Um, it's a it appears to be out of a shell or a, a bone. It appears to be that of a, a small bird. Initially, in 19 or in 2000, when the uh, second or the first exhumation occurred, the identification was still a, a male and a female because DNA had not proven to be two females, possibly brother or sister. So these are two artists' rendition of facial reconstruction. And these are the, the two girls that you see in front of you. The next slide will show <coughs> Carrie Graham and the, the facial reconstruction of what the, uh, the bones believe to have occurred. I will say that in 2000, something occurred that was is very important. Then forensic odontologist um, Jim Wood, who's now California State Assemblyman Jim Wood, was the first person to send a letter to the sheriff's office stating that he had examined all of the x-rays of, of the uh, jaws, and he did not believe the opinion that these two found, found people were related. He specifically stated that the, the jaws appeared to be of two people from different genetic makeups. Uh, Assemblyman Wood was supposed to be here today, and he got called back to Sacramento. So the Sheriff's Office has been working with a lot of organizations and people throughout the last 36 and a half years. We certainly appreciate the Graham family and the Trimble family for their patience more than anything else. I hope that you never would believe that we've forgotten this case. This case is as active as ever has been and, and Detective Cromer is continuing to work. This is the first, first notebook on his desk. University of North Texas was the uh, DNA, as I said, they were the ones who made the determination of who, who the girls, who the victims were. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children are an organization, a nationwide organization that works internationally. And they are our strongest partners when it comes time to um, identify and to recover live and deceased children. They certainly do everything they possibly can for the sake of allowing families the comfort of knowing what happened to their loved ones. The National Missing and Unidentified Persons System is uh, NamUs was the very first organization that we were able to submit um, the, the situation to for comparison on any other uh, incident. Now, when this occurred, when the remains were found in 1979, uh, nationally and throughout Canada, the alert was sent. So we were trying to find any situation where a male and a female in their teens were missing and they were unidentified. So. Looking back, of course, it was two females, but and whether that was the, the error of cause to, to go so long, we don't know the answer. Forensic anthropologist Dr. Frederick Snow was involved in the initial identification 
And as I spoke about, Dr. James Wood, now Assemblyman James Wood, was involved in the positive identification. They were not related. The British Broadcasting System Corporation is certainly an organization that we are very much appreciative to for getting this started with Nick Nick and having the Sheriff's Office get refocused on this. And that allied agencies, we certainly appreciate our friends to the South Sonoma County and all the other law enforcement agencies that we've worked with throughout the last 36 years. In closing, for my part, Quincy Detective Cromer, Cromer um, is, is very much um, hoping that we're going to get information. We're working to get some type of reward. It hasn't been finalized yet, so I can't talk the dollar amount. But we're hoping that somebody within, either in Sonoma County or Mendocino County can come forward with some information that can help us. So with that, I'd like to start with a question from the press. Or from the family, really. When you mentioned they were going to be exhumed a couple of times, were they actually buried in the ground then? No, they actually were in a cement vault above the ground, and it was a very simple process. Um, so, and and their bones remained absolutely intact from where they were first put in. That's what I was told when they were removed from the the crypt, so to speak. You're welcome, Adam. The bones did not indicate a cause of death. I have two of the, uh, I have the two original death certificates up here for Jane Doe and John Doe, and the death certificate is, is cause of death is unknown. When I say cause of death, when what we look for on bones is any signs of violence, and we believe that those bones have been carefully examined, and there's no significant markings on the bones. There are some bones, there are some markings that appear to be from an animal but there are no markings that would indicate violence. Jimmy? About how much time has, has the department invested in this? I, I, well, I don't know the answer. I know that it's uh, gone through four sheriffs. It started with Sheriff John Dahl. So um, this case has always been a case that, and I, I think Detective Gorley would, would uh, be the one to answer this. This case has always been one that whoever's working detectives has said, it sure would be nice to solve this case in our lifetime. This is a, a senseless case, a senseless tragedy that has caused every person in detectives to want to get involved in solving this. Any questions? Okay, to the phone. Are there any questions on the phone? Yes, Jane O'Brien here from BBC News, British Broadcasting Corporation in Washington. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for your comments about um, the partnership we had with Nick Nick in, um, as you said, refocusing efforts. Um, I, I apologize, I obviously can't see who's there, um, but I'm wondering if there are any reaction from the family members who may be present? Um, how do they feel about the fact that they now know um, who these children are? Is there a representative from the family? Yes, I, I, I can speak. I'm Will Walsh. I am the uncle of uh, Francine Trimble. Um, I would say that we, we were happy to know we had largely resigned ourselves to never knowing why they disappeared. Um, we suspected that maybe uh, foul play had been involved. So uh, we're, we're we're glad to know now that we have a definite answer to that. Uh, as you might, might imagine, the death, uh, knowledge of the death brought it all open for us. It's like just learning of the death, as if it had just happened. And um, we were, were bereaved in that sense. Um, we missed Francine. And, regret deeply that she never had a chance at a good life. Right, does that answer your question, Jane? Thank you very much indeed. I, I really appreciate that. Is, is there a personal message that you would like to put out now um, that might encourage people to come forward with more information? I would just urge them to do so. I'm, I'm very impressed with the that so many people here cared. 
we really didn't know that. That everything that you've told us about your efforts, uh, Sheriff Allman, is a real surprise to us. We thought that this was a forgotten case until we were uh, contacted by Nick Nick within the last couple of years. I think first of all to uh, harvest DNA from our family. Um, It would just really be wonderful to solve this case. And Jane, I'm just going to say, to answer your question, because it would be the right thing to do. I'm, I'm sorry, I lost you there. Well, you asked, what would I say if somebody had information, why should they bring it forward? And it's because it's, it would be the right thing to do. Absolutely. Sure. Right. Sure. I, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I'm sorry, just for the sake of clarification again, I, I don't know who's actually talking. Um, sorry, could you identify the, the first two um, representatives from the Sheriff's Office who spoke? Uh, Sheriff Tom Allman, A-L-L-M-A-N. I think Thank I was, I think I was the second one also. All right. And then I was and then to Will, Will Walsh. W-A-L-S-H. W-A-L-S-H. Will Walsh is the uncle of Francine Trimble. Of Francine Trimble. Thank you. Thank Ron, you very much. We have, we have Ron. We have uh, Ron. Yeah. Ron Graham. I'm Ron Graham. Graham. I'm Carrie with my younger sister, my younger sister. Um, I, as far as what you said, you said it's a shock. I mean, even though you, you always held up some hope that Maybe somehow, somewhere, some way that you kind of knew in your heart it probably wasn't going to happen. But I, all I can say is, you know, people say it's better to know. I would say, okay, I think in the long run it will be. But at the moment, I don't know that I can say that it's better than one group. Well, thank you, Ron. And, and I know you came in from out of state for this. And I certainly um, can only imagine that you always held out hope that maybe she's out there somewhere. Yeah. We're very sorry. Anything else, Jane? No, that, that's it. I, and thank you very much um, for talking to me in, in sort of remotely when this must be a very difficult situation for you. I really appreciate that. Is there anybody else on the phone with a question? Okay. Well, if there's not anything more, we're going to conclude. I will say this to the press that's here. I would ask that you respect the privacy of the family. If a family wishes to speak to you, then they'll let you know if they speak, want to speak to you. If a family member does not want to speak to the press, all you have to do is find any Mendocino County Sheriff's Office uniform in this room and tell us you don't want to talk to them and we will make sure that your wishes are taken care of. I appreciate everyone coming today and thank you for helping us solve this case.